Well, good morning and welcome to the Church at Avenue South. My name is Aaron Bryant and I'm the campus and teaching pastor. And on behalf of our church family, let me extend a welcome to you and thank you so much for carving out time out of your busy weekend and for making space on this Sunday morning to be with us in worship. I know that on our live stream, there are people that do not live in the southeastern United States uh, that worship with us. Uh, there are people in Georgia and Texas and Alabama that worship with us every Sunday, Kentucky as well. But there are people in Maryland and Pennsylvania, other places. If you don't live in Middle Tennessee and, and you're not part of our church family here in Nashville, you may not be aware that over the last 10 to 12 hours, we got enough of that wintry weather mix of snow and ice, some spots more than others, but we got enough of it that we had to make the incredibly difficult decision to close our church facility today. Now, let me say something to our church family. This decision is not one we make lightly and like I lament and grieve ever having to do this. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 25, don't neglect, let us not neglect coming together the first day of the week and uniting with one another. There's no substitute for the enfleshed body of Christ. And so we want you to be a part of what's happening here on Sunday mornings. If you're healthy and able, you need to be here. But how important is it to have community, right? At the core of what it means to be human, I truly believe is that you're created for relationship. So how many times over the last several years have you heard me or somebody from our staff on the platform say how important it is for you to be in a life group, a Bible reading group, or a mentor relationship? How important is it for you to serve in one of our ministry areas throughout the building or throughout the week? The reason that's important is because you're still connected. And although this is inconvenient and it bums us out, you're still very much connected to the church when you're in relationship with others. So let me just say, I hate that we can't be together. But we learned during 2020 that we can do this. Now, I know some of you just got sick to your stomach. We hate even referencing that year. But we did learn that we can do this. We can worship virtually together as a church family, not because we want to, but because we have to. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, somebody in our church gave me this coffee mug. I consume probably way too much coffee throughout the day, but it says running on coffee and Jesus I got to be honest with you, 2022 is weird and it's thrown us some curveballs already. I got my coffee. I'm running on coffee this morning. I hope you are as well, but I'm also running on Jesus. I'm grateful that we can worship Jesus and he's got something to say to us, whether we're gathered together or we are scattered as the church throughout Middle Tennessee and other parts of our country. So I hope that you will make yourself comfortable, whether you're in your dorm room at one of our universities you're with roommates or in your apartment or with your family. And maybe you got kids wrestling on the living room rug right now while you are trying to worship and pay attention. I love it. That is, that's life. We're glad you're here. And I thought we might start this morning by sharing just a couple of stories of encouragement. If you're bummed out about not meeting, I thought it'd be great to share just a couple of really encouraging stories. And the first one I want to share with you is that our church family has opened up a dedicated facility to serve, bless, and come alongside of families that are facing and working with special needs and disabilities. Let me tell you about the Rowan Glen Center that just opened at our Brentwood campus. You may not be aware that 10 miles from here, our Brentwood campus, our original campus that helped plant us in 2014, just opened last Sunday afternoon a nearly 6,000 square feet facility dedicated to our friends that are facing challenges that many of us can't appreciate or just don't encounter on a weekly basis. If you've ever prayed that we would use the bricks and the mortar of our churches to serve the community, you've been a part of praying into the vision of the Rowan Glen Center. If you've ever given of your talents or your time in serving to help this church do what we feel God has called us to do, you have played a part in helping us launch and open the Rowan Glen Center for Families with Special Needs and Disabilities. And if you've ever worshiped through giving of your financial treasures to fund the advancement of our mission as a church, you've had a part in launching the Rowan Glen Center for families with special needs and facing disabilities. I'm so grateful that you're part of a church that has multiple campuses throughout Middle Tennessee where we can pull our resources together. We are better together than we are as individuals. 
we can pull our resources together and that even our campus is in a position that should we have the opportunity to meet friends in the community that this facility will bless, it's just a drive away. It's just a few miles down the road and you're part of it. So here now from Tiffany McCullough, our special needs minister at the Brentwood campus, as she walks you through and shares just a little bit of the story of the Rowan Glen Center. Good morning, church family. We are so excited to celebrate our first Sunday in the Rowan Glen Center. It's absolutely thrilling that we're able to welcome each of our friends, families, and volunteers in the Embrace Special Needs Ministry to our new space today. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you to each of you who gave generously to make this dream become a reality for families and individuals that have been impacted by disability. Church family, it is because of your kind generosity that we were able to design intentional details and spaces throughout this building that allow us to meet the unique physical, sensory, and spiritual needs of each of our friends. We would be so grateful for your continued prayers as we transition into this new space. Please pray that God will give each of our ministry friends and families a sense of peace, calm, and belonging. Pray that the Lord will continue to bless our efforts to reach more families, both in our community and across Middle Tennessee, who need to know of the rest, hope, and joy that only Jesus brings as they are able to come and be a part of our church and our Embrace Special Needs family. Wow, what an incredible story. Good morning, church family. My name is Matthew Page, and I'm the Missions and Connection Minister for the Church at Avenue South. And I want to take a moment to share with you another incredible story of how your giving is making a difference. Recently, we took a team to Guatemala City, Guatemala. There were 23 individuals on this journey, and we partnered with Clubhouse Ministries. Clubhouse is a Hope for the World missions partner. Our medical team treated over 100 patients, and each one of those patients heard the good news of the gospel. We also distributed over 280 Christmas packs. That's right, those Christmas packs were the ones that you helped to pack and provide supplies. And every boy and girl that received a Christmas pack heard the good news of the gospel. In addition, we made about 90 home visits where we delivered 100 bags of food. And there our team had the honor and the privilege of praying for, meeting with, and sharing the good news of the gospel in the homes of the men and women in the village of Bacayo. And your giving helped make that possible. Not only did 400 people hear the gospel, but there were 17 decisions for Jesus. That's right. We should celebrate that. Not only boys and girls, but men and women gave their life to Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you to give this morning. There are two ways you can do that. You can give online or you can text the word give to 623-623. Your giving helped introduce these Guatemalans to Jesus Christ. Not only did you help scholarship men and women to go on the journey, but your giving provided tangible resources like the food, the rice, and the beans that were delivered in those 90 homes. So I can't say thank you enough for your generosity, and I want to encourage you to be diligent and faithful and to give. Now let's pray before we hear from God's Word. Dear Jesus, we celebrate those 17 salvations, those men and women, those boys and girls who came to know you. We continue to pray for our team on the ground, uh, men and women like Pablo and Oso and Fernando and Dieter and Kayla. God, that you would continue to give them favor in those communities as they serve. Lord, we pray that men and women would continue to come to know you. Lord, may we be a church that is passionate about sending people out locally, nationally, and globally to serve. Lord, I thank you for the resources and the tithes and offerings that are given. And may we give those and return those back to you to be used for the kingdom. It's your name we pray. Amen. Well, church family, let's continue worshiping by reading God's word together. And if you have a copy of the scriptures, let me invite you to join me in the New Testament book of John. And while you're turning there, let me state the obvious for you. I'm sharing with you from one of the preschool classrooms here at the church. Over seven years ago when we planted this church, we named the preschool and children's area here in our building The Grove. Now, the reason we did that is because the prophet Isaiah said that God's desire for the next generation 
is that the word of God would take root in their hearts like a seed planted in soil and that it would be watered and nurtured. Uh, many of you who put these posters on these walls and prepare lessons and read the Bible to children, like you're helping nurture and water that seed in their hearts so that ultimately children would come to faith in Christ believe that Jesus is their ultimate hope, and grow up to be teenagers and adults who flourish and are confident in their faith. And Isaiah actually said that our prayer would be that they'd become oaks of righteousness. So one of the reasons with the inclement weather and the reality that we can't be together in person this morning that I want to be here in this room is to say to all of our preschool and children, we love you and we see you and we're grateful for you. I, I miss seeing Damien and Kai and Quinn and Harper, uh, Wendy and Caroline, Finn and crew. I mean, I, I could go on and on. And parents, I better stop while I'm ahead. I, I'm going to leave somebody's name out. and Some child in this church is going to be upset with their pastor. So I'm going to stop right there. But I'm so grateful that all of us, all generations are together right now reading God's word. And as we dig into the gospel of John, let me remind you that John was a follower of Jesus. He was one of the original disciples. And one of the things he's done for us is he has written and recorded his eyewitness account of the life and the ministry of Jesus. And last week, we read the first five verses together, and I want to reread that. It'll set up our time in verses 6 through 23 today. So let's, let's start in verse 1 again. It says, In the beginning was the Word. And that refers to the person of Jesus. So in the beginning was Jesus. And the word was with God, and Jesus was God. Verse 2, Jesus was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. Let me pause right there for just a moment. That may sound like a confusing sentence, but what John is telling us, I mean, he, he probably could stop there and boil his entire gospel down into that statement, that Jesus has the authority and the power to give life as God intended it. And conversely, apart from Jesus, no thing and no person, that includes you and me, truly flourishes like we were intended. That's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. And, and that's what he describes in the next verse as well. In him, that's Jesus, verse 4, in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of men. This room is illuminated. It's got fluorescent lights in here. And the reason for that is so that the children on Sunday morning can see, so they don't run into furniture. Like, light brings order to spaces. It brings clarity. They can read. The children in this room can read what's on the walls, and they can see the different toys and things in this room because light has brought order. It's brought clarity. It's brought about purpose. So John literally says light that Jesus brings into the world brings order and clarity and significance to all humans. Verse 5, the light of Jesus shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John uses the metaphor of light and dark quite a bit throughout his gospel account and in his letters that he wrote to Christians later, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, later in the back of the New Testament. He uses that metaphor. Now, here's one of the things that I would want you to remember today. So if you, if you have a journal open, or you write in the margin of your Bible, just here's one thing you want to write down. It is a beautiful but a broken world. There are things that are broken and wrong and, and even just downright evil and sinful. And as much as those things might cause you to be discouraged, don't give in to despair. God intends for you when you see the brokenness in our world for it to create a craving and a hunger for the light. One of the reasons that God still allows brokenness in our world is that he intends for it to stir up in you and all of humanity a desire for someone to redeem and restore what's wrong in our world. And that is the person of Jesus Christ. Our responsibility, our desire, I, I hope it's not an obligation for you, I hope it's a joy, is to tell people in a broken world about the light and the hope that we can have in Christ. We are all witnesses. Here's a question for you, and this may be challenging or even convicting. When's the last time you witnessed to someone else about the light of Jesus? 
When is the last time you told someone else about the light of Jesus? Now, it, it may be that you did that this past week. It may be that it's been a few months. And for some of us, that's a convicting question because it's it may have been years since you told someone about Jesus. Listen, there is brokenness all around us. And when you see it, don't complain about it. Don't lament it as much as you say, well, what an opportunity to tell people about the hope that they can have in Jesus. Let me give you an example of somebody who did that really well. Look, look at what it says in verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And, and this is referring to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. So you got John the disciple who wrote this gospel now introducing John the Baptist into the narrative or the story of Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist, verse 7, came as a witness he came to bear witness about the light that all people might believe through him. What this literally means is that John the Baptist was sent by God to tell people that it's a broken world and that you need redemption and that hope is on the way. Now, John the Baptist was a guy that you probably wouldn't invite to dinner parties. You might not be friends with him on social media. Like he, John the Baptist does serious real well. And what I mean by that is he is very serious. He's very like right up in your face. He's also a little bit odd, a little bit weird. John the Baptist lived out in the wilderness. Uh, he ate locust and honey. Locusts are bugs. How gross. He ate bugs and honey. Like he probably had other options, but that's what he chose to eat. And he didn't wear garments like uh, normal clothing like other people. He, he wore animal skins. So when he showed up in any civilized part of the area of Galilee, people thought he was weird. And not only that, when he shows up, he grabs your attention and he doesn't say, it's a beautiful but broken world and Jesus is the light of the world. No, he's like, it's broken, it's evil, and your only hope is the light that's coming into the world. So he really grabbed people's attention. Here's a couple of things to think about as a witness. We are all witnesses of the light that is Jesus Christ. I don't think it's super effective to be overwhelming or to browbeat people, but you and I are only six or seven verses into the Gospel of John, and it's pretty clear God intends for the people who follow him to be witnesses. And our brother Peter in the New Testament says that we should do that with compassion and kindness. So again, when is the last time you told somebody about Jesus? And have you ever used something that's broken in our world to point people to the hope that we can have in Christ? You know, this past week, let me, let me tell you a very vivid example for me. This past week, I saw brokenness in our world that I lamented, but it also gave me a chance to tell people about how Jesus can make this right. He, he's the light that we're looking for. Several years ago when we planted this church, Tammy Adams was one of our launch team members, and she led our nurture team. Tammy led our nurture team. And if you don't know what they do, our nurture team used to write handwritten notes and put together uh, baskets with encouraging resources in them for people in our church who maybe had received great news or welcomed a, a baby into their family or gone through an adoption. And Tammy would write a note like, God is so good and we love you, your church loves you, and we're praying for you. The nurture team would also write notes of encouragement to people who had gone through the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job. Um, maybe you're not a, a preacher or a worship leader, or you don't want to be on the platform at church, but there's always a need for people in our church to be encouragers and to minister to people in their time of need. And that's what Tammy did. Tammy also dealt privately often with her 12 year battle with cancer. She was super humble. She really didn't tell a lot of people. And if you didn't know her well, you might not have ever guessed it. But about 10 days ago, Tammy lost her battle with cancer and went home to be with the Lord. Now, immediately when I heard the news of her passing and had the privilege of joining our staff to celebrate her life at her celebration of life service, we intuitively knew, like, this, this makes us sad. This is not right. This is not the way it was supposed to be. But it also gave us a chance, like Paul told the church in Thessalonica, like he would tell the church at Avenue South, although we grieve and lament the darkness we don't grieve without hope because we know there's light for the darkness. There is an answer for the darkness. And I was able to tell people at Tammy's funeral about the hope that we can have in Jesus Christ. And, and look, you know, somebody who 
could tell that better than me at her own service was Tammy. Tammy lived her entire life as a follower of Jesus, telling other people about the hope and the light in a beautiful but broken world that they could find in the person of Jesus. The, the brokenness that you see in our world is an opportunity for you to witness about the light and the hope that we can have in Jesus. Now, I know there's a lot of Tammies here. Your name may be different, but there's a lot of people in our congregation. You have the privilege to go tell people about Jesus in places where our church staff cannot go or is not invited. That's what John the writer did. That's what John the Baptist did. That's what we're called to do. And look at what it says in verse 8. John the Baptist was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. Oh, that's wonderful. Jesus doesn't expect you to be the light. He, he expects you to tell people that he's the light. Hopefully that relieves a lot of pressure off of you. You don't have to close the deal. You don't have to uh, see certain metrics or results. Jesus just wants you to be faithful to tell people that he's the light of the world. In verse 9, it says, The true light, that's Jesus, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. John the Baptist told people Jesus is on his way. He's coming. And Jesus was in the world, verse 10. And the world was made through Jesus, yet the world did not know him. And what that literally means is a lot of people back then in first century Galilee looked for, they looked for ways to fix the brokenness in their own efforts. They tried to be religious. They tried to make money. They tried to find happiness in relationships. Not much different than 2022. A lot of our world is trying to find light in the midst of hard circumstances or darkness in their own effort. And so one of the things that happened is some people didn't recognize that Jesus is what they've been looking for. And it says in verse 11, Jesus even came to his own people, the Jews, and his own people didn't re recognize him. There were some Jewish people that accepted Jesus as the light and the hope of the world, the one they had been waiting on. And the name for the one they'd been naming, waiting on was the Messiah. Some Jews did accept Jesus as the light of the world, but many did not, and many rejected him. And so the Bible says that Jesus then made himself available to all people, Jew or Gentile, that whosoever believes in Jesus could have that light, could have eternal life in him. And in verse 12, it says, to all who did receive Jesus and to all who do receive Jesus today, who believe in his name, Jesus gives them the right to become children of God. Children who were born not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, there it is. You and I cannot find the hope, the flourishing that we've been looking for in our own effort or our own merit. No matter how good or hardworking we are, or how religious we are, we cannot obtain it apart from Jesus. So in verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's the arrival of Jesus. One translation and one pastor I know says, the, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. The light of the world is here and it's found in the person of Jesus. We've seen his glory, verse 14, the glory of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him, and John cried out, verse 15 says, This is who I told you about, that he who comes after me in my ministry ranks greater priority than me, because he was before me. John the Baptist is simply saying, I told y'all Jesus was coming He's here now. He's always existed, and everything you've ever been looking for is found in him. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. No one has ever seen God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side. He's made him known. Everything that can be known about God has been revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. So our responsibility, our joy, hopefully you see it as a joy and an opportunity, is to look for moments where things aren't right in our world and to tell people that the answer or the solution can be found in Jesus Christ. And let me just finish by reading verses 19 through 23 here. When John did arrive, people thought maybe he's the Messiah. He's a little bit odd, a little bit weird, but maybe who he's been waiting on. And in verse 19, it says, and this is the testimony of John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem out to him, they asked him, who are you? In verse 20, it says, he confessed and he did not deny, but he confessed, I'm not Jesus. Like, I'm not the one you've been waiting on. I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, 
Well, what then? Are you Elijah? Are you a prophet? And he said, no. Verse 22, so they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who have sent us to you to find out who you are. And in verse 23, John the Baptist said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as the prophet Isaiah has already told you. So even when people went to John the Baptist and said, are you the one we've been waiting on? He said, nope, not at all. But the one you're waiting on is yet to come. Now, we live on this side of Jesus' arrival. We live on this side of Jesus' arrival, his death on the cross, his burial, and even his resurrection. We live on this side of the resurrection. I want you to think about something as God's witnesses. John the Baptist came as a witness to tell people that Jesus was coming. You and I have what I believe is perhaps an even more exciting witness to share with the world. We get to not only witness and share, yes, Jesus has already come, but we get to witness and testify that Jesus will come again. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus returns for the second time, he will remake a new heaven and a new earth. And he will inaugurate, he will unleash a new kingdom of which there will be no end to his reign. It'll be a literal new heaven and a new earth where there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no crying, there's no mourning. The people of God are with God, like nothing can separate us from him. And that we will be with one another and we will be fully known, fully loved, and fully flourishing as God has always intended it to be. Now, how much of a compelling witness is that to a lost and searching world that we get to say, not only has Jesus come, but you're not going to believe what happens when he comes back. Listen, if you're not using opportunities of brokenness in our world to point people to Jesus, this is your wake-up call. This is our call from the Gospel of John. This is the Holy Spirit's attention getter to you right now, wherever you're watching this. Do not miss another opportunity to redeem moments of brokenness and hardship in our world to point people to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It is a beautiful world and God loves this world, but it will not be fully flourishing as God intended until Jesus returns. And what makes that possible is the work that he's already accomplished on the cross and through the power of the resurrection the first time he came. Let me do this. Let me pray for us that we would be gospel witnesses. And look, if you're intimidated by that, do what John said. John said, it ain't about me. It ain't about me. Let me just tell you about Jesus. I just want to tell you about Jesus. Start by this week just sharing with somebody what you love about Jesus. Share a story with somebody in your family. Share a story with your children. If you're watching this live stream with your children, share with them right when this finishes something that you've seen God do within the past week, within the past few months. Be a witness in your own home. And don't put the pressure on yourself. Start by saying, I am not Jesus, but I want to tell you about who he is because I love him and he's the light of the world and I want him to do for you what he's done for me. But let's definitely be a church of witnesses that are faithful to tell people about the light of the world. Let me pray for us that we do that. God, thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for coming into a beautiful but broken world and offering us the light of eternal life. I pray that the women and the men, the children, the teenagers, those of us that are part of the church at Avenue South would be light and witnesses to point other people in this world to the ultimate eternal life and light of Jesus Christ. Give us the courage and the confidence to do that. And we pray that in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. I love y'all. I miss not being with you in person, but I can't wait till next Sunday when we pick up in John's gospel again. Hey, go find you a hill or a place where you can sled and make a snowman, do something to get out in creation.